So anyway, this is Bill Former. And uh, I don't think there's anybody in the world that knows Cherry Island better than you. I first went there in 1960. Um, okay. And I'd have to do the math to figure out how old I was. Not, not awfully. Um, but this is it. It was over 60 years ago, so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, how time flies when you're having fun. Enjoy, enjoy the lecture. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Take care, Bill. This magically records both the sound and it just told me it wanted to do video as well. So I'm going to turn it on and I'll be pushing the button a number of times and also highlighting a couple of items along the way. Well, Terry's Island, it's kind of dim, but um, this is an early morning fog view of two small islands in the river as you approach Terry's Island, which is behind them. This is an annotated um, story of um, the gathering ground of 1873 and the bandwagon uh, that was there. A little clearer view. Um, I will bring it out after the program, but I do have this picture on a paper copy. Right there is the barn, right there is the house. And as far as I know, that's the only picture that shows that. The house was taken down about 1905 and moved to the mainland. Once upon many times ago, from Noah and the Great Flood to the predictions that have been in recent news media was an historical series of events, though not including the end of days that virtually ended the not really golden uh, gilded age and seem nearer to events described in Revelation. Beating the drum or rises and falls in the tempo, looking at the history of Adventism, Millerism onward, um, you find various sects split off after Miller and uh, along the way there was more fallout that's shown on a graph. The important part here is uh, the events in the 17 to 1800s regarding revivalism and Miller, millennialism and the Millerites. And lastly, the most important to us is uh, the views of the Timist. The first Great Awakening was back uh, during the 1730s and 1740s up and through there. Quite early, it was a renewed dedication toward religion. And a great boost to that was the work of Jonathan Edwards um, with um, his sermon, uh, Sinners, uh, regarding an angry God, back in 1741, which was done in Enfield, where I'm now residing and that boulder is right along um, the main street, um, King Street or uh, US 5 in Enfield. That's still there now? The, is it still there now? The boulder is still there now, yeah. 
It's right across from uh, the Felician Sisters, the other side of the road. There was a second Great Awakening and a third um, spanning uh, from the late 1850s into the early 20th century. And at that point, uh, it led to the founding of several colleges, one of which um, was Wilbraham Academy in Wilbraham. Um, and there's more information to follow there. Realize that I've spent the time from um, 2007 or so researching and developing a research work that will end up this thick with all of the different references and things that are copied and included into it. This is a brief look at the era of the Terries. Eighteen thirties into the later eighteen forties, uh, the Millerite movement. Miller sought to bring good people to rejoice in heaven. Salvation of other souls came under the purview of other religions. Millerites were a, minor, a majority, second only to the Mormons in numbers. Millerites having uh, mostly remained. in their own churches following Miller's philosophy of the second coming and preparing for the arrival of Judgment Day. Um, the Terries were involved in that movement and there's more to follow here also. 1858, more Great Awakening going on and newspaper account of it. All of this will be available on a DVD that I'll leave um, as it's complete down uh, at the historical room uh, in days to follow. Leaders of the band, Weeds in the Garden of Eden, Seeds of Evil, Discontent or Delusion, or Bad Apple Spoiling the Barrel. There being hardly enough time for more than a cursory look, it's a very quick incomplete for sure list to provide a lot of details that would keep us here until at least midnight and maybe midnight of days to follow. It's a book. <laughs> this one outlines some of the diversity that followed. Second day Advent, Adventist come along later. First day is down here. Seventh day begin here. All about 1945 to 1948, along or 1848, uh, along and through um, that time. And we have spiritualizing Adventist here. Uh, this is the end of Millerism, sort of. Uh, First Day Adventists carry it on. Age to come Adventist life and Advent union. That's what we're here about. Advent Christian Church. Uh, evolved on down, going into Russell's Bible studies and on uh, into Jehovah's Witness things. Uh, Seventh-day Church of God is up there. And again, there are paper things that I'll bring in so that you can have a closer look at some of these things. Mother Ann Lee, 
uh, familiar to most in the Enfield area as there were Shaker villages there and she was the uh, founder of that movement. The United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing or the Shakers. And she spoke of visions and messages from God claiming she had received a vision from God, the message that celibacy and confession of sin are the only true road to salvation and the only way in which the kingdom of God could be established on the earth. Uh, they were noted for um, their shaking, the, the dancing in their meetings. Uh, it's not a bright picture, but um, again, that's the view of the North family uh, village within the whole Shaker complex. Most of which was lost to uh, the decimation. Uh, they even took all the cemetery headstones and piled them up into one monument uh, by the state of Connecticut uh, to build the prisons in Enfield. Uh, right now in Enfield, uh, normally Ann and I would be working at the Enfield Historical Society. The museum is open on Sundays, 1 to 5. If you get in that area, please stop by. Uh, a lot of Shaker history is kept there as well. Lastly, in all the verbiage, is that a number of followers who had joined the New Light uh, movement in New Lebanon, New York, um, they experienced a 10-year period of revelations in 1837 called the Era of Manifestation, which is also called Mother Anne's work. Joseph Smith, Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. By early 1843, Latter-day Saints in Nuovo, Illinois had already known about Miller's predictions and anticipated their future and failure. Latter-day Saints leaders appeared to be confident that Miller's persuasive doctrine would have no power to sway the saints. Uh, although Miller never claimed to be a prophet, he provided the saints with an opportunity to express and uh, strengthen their belief that Joseph Smith was a living prophet. Jonas Wendell, after the great disappointment of 1844, that being Miller had predicted that the end of the world would come then, and it didn't, and there was disappointment. He went on to hook up with others. Um, in 1870, he published his findings in a booklet called The Present Truth or Meet in Due Season. Um, and again, that um, booklet is still available. Wendell wasn't alone in his predictions um, that the literal return of Christ would take place in 1873 to 1874. So we're coming into this uh, thinking uh, done by the timist. They began to calculate things from uh, previous times in early history. Uh, he got involved with the um, publishing of um, World Crisis and the Advent Christian Times. Miles Grant, another Adventist preacher in the 1800s and an advocate of conditional immortality and annihilationism. Um, 
Adventism being a branch of Protestantism with its origins back in the early Protestant revival, the Second Awakening. The interesting thing with him is he um, met um, Ellen White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, they had face-to-face -face meetings in which uh, he expressed a deep animosity toward her and believed that she was possessed by a demon um, more on her to come. Nelson Barber, uh, Adventist writer and publisher, known for his association and later opposition to Charles Case Russell um, and others. We come to a point where there are a list of names. Jonathan Cummings, a disciple of Miller who reset Miller's prediction of Christ coming to 1854 founded the Advent Christian Church and also influenced individuals who founded the Advent Christian Association. Jonathan Cummings, disciple of Miller, Hiram Edson, pioneer of Seventh-day Adventist Church, known for introducing the sanctuary doctrine. Um, he was a Methodist, many of the early Adventists were, and became a Sabbath-keeping Adventist. Um, there are so many, so many versions of the name associated with Adventists. And again, they are particular offshoots. Joseph Bates, associated with several reforms, including temperance and anti-slavery. The real founder of the Seventh-day Adventist was Joseph Bates. And uh, he did that along with James and Ellen White. Ellen G. White was an author, American Christian pioneer, along with other Adventist leaders, such as Bates and her husband. She was instrumental within a small group of early Adventists who formed what is known as Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, she also experienced in a group like this where she would speak um, trances, etc., uh, visions, uh, and there were doubting Thomases among the crowd. And one, one of the things being, there is a term um, that probably evolved out of Danbury, Connecticut here, where uh, there were many hat factories, uh, the term being a mad hatter, uh, where they sadly did go mad from their exposure to mercury in the hat making process at the time. And she worked with her father uh, with mercury in her father's hat making works, which led to a plausible explanation of uh, her visions, etc., etc. Hard to know. Another associated with um, Seventh day Adventism is Dr. John Kellogg. His brother uh, associated with Kellogg's cornflakes. Um, they were into good nutrition and they founded a sanitarium um, out in Battle Creek, Michigan. George H. Storrs, 
Storrs continued regular work until 1936 when he became a local preacher, three years without an appointment, but he kept working. In 1842, he preached his six sermons on immortality, which were subsequently printed and extensively circulated. And in 1843, he commenced the publication of the Bible Examiner. Terry's Island also had a history of different names. Um, it has been known as the Great Island originally, Copper Island, or some copper was found there, Pynchon Island, Pynchons being the founders of the plantations of Springfield and Suffield and Enfield back in the time when those areas were thought to be in Massachusetts. The Great Island is the largest permanent island in the river. Uh, it's made out of shale, and in that shale are any number of dinosaur footprints. And one of the photos I'm going to bring again in is a 200% enlargement of insect tracks that were found in the siltstone there, which Yale would love to have. Reverend Ephraim Hewitt died in 1644. He had obtained the island from the Indians, uh, the Indians having suffered from the early plague. Um, they weren't using the island at that time, so they took uh, a pittance for the island. Uh, he left it to the court at Hartford for the use of the public. Back following that time, there were other owners of the island who purchased it from the Indians only to have it taken away because the law prevented the private purchase from the Indians of public lands. The past is fraught territory in every country until barely a generation ago, U.S. textbooks rarely acknowledged the complex universe inhabited by the Native Americans. And that comes out of um, some writings in National Geographic. Uh, one thing, local legend, urban legend, is another real treatment in the book. On the left, you can see a mound somewhere. They're not going to work. There we are. Right here is a mound of dirt. It looks like an above the ground grave. Right here is a rotting tree trunk. We had a storm, oh, probably 2010, 11 in which there was a blowdown. There are four trees right in a row that were blown down. What happens is the trees rot, they fall, the dirt clump held by the roots falls to the ground and makes an interesting mound. So it looks like this is going to become a cemetery, an Indian cemetery at some point in the opinion of urban legend. However, we don't have any real evidence that the Indians lived there. They hunted and fished there as do their contemporaries these days, but uh, no graves. The Terries. We're going to talk about the early times of living on the Windsor Locks Farm, followed by life on the island, Camp Bethel, and Springfield.
Anybody recognize this pair? <laughs> I would think so. Uh, any known relatives of the Terry's? For sure. Nice. Um, more has been collected and published since Edith Ball did her original draft. Um, back in 1977, Lester Smith was in contact with Alice Ball and he received six carbon copies of the um, manuscript which were dispersed to societies and libraries in the Suffield area, most of which disappeared and there's always talk of having found the missing manuscript. Uh, copies abound. Somewhere along the line, more copies were made. Lester did make some copies uh, after the sad disappearance of some of the original copy copies. But um, I have these two prints. Unfortunately, they're on paper and they're cracked and uh, I was able to uh, put a backing behind them, photograph them, and have a son who followed me into the graphics art field and uh, fixed them. <laughs> so we have, you know, decent copies of these two of uh, Clint and Maria. I'm gonna see if I can get that off the corner. No. Okay. A little bit of the genealogy, a uh, very little bit, uh, deals with Clint and uh, Maria and the daughters. And sadly, um, the young lady who passed, uh, she drowned. Uh, on the shores of uh, Terry's Island. Followed by Dorothy, who was adopted, and she was one year old back in the 1900 census. Um, and lived on and had a happy life as the two older sisters did. Suffield Street in Windsor Locks. This is the Terry Farm house. And it's at the corner of Suffield Street and North um, Street in Windsor Locks. A large pot of land which was uh, purchased beyond Terry's stay there. The important thing was that during that stay, um, we're going to get to it also, tent meetings were held in the yard in Windsor Locks. The Terrys, both Solomon Jr. and DeWitt, were Methodists of Warehouse Point. Being Millerites, they picked up the cause and a ready following and true to the philosophy of Miller expected the same in terms of how the end would come. Their activities in concert with vigorous beliefs of Reverend Moses Stoddard nearly led to the demise of that Warehouse Point Church. Its members saw no reason to continue supporting it through ties. Fortunately, there were a couple uh, generous contribution of financially able men and the church did survive. That was the church at the time of um, Clint Terry and um, 1832 Solomon was around also. Uh, the hall was sold in 18, 
1999 to become Mechanics Hall. A new church was built and dedicated in 1900. Camp meetings. A typical camp meeting lasted eight to 10 days, sometimes longer. Camp meetings still go on all over the United States these days and beyond. Uh, I have one volume that came out of Ireland discussing tent meetings there back in the 1800s. Sometimes uh, unruly folks would show up at the tent meetings uh, and disturb things. Others were convinced to convert. Here's a really big tent meeting. Important evangelism tool used by the United Methodist, J.V. Himes organized extensive lecture tours for William Miller and himself as far west, west of Cincinnati and brought about the manufacture of the Great Tent, at that time the largest tent in the United States for use on the tours. Clint Terry made himself a tent and it's written in Ball's book that uh, weighed about 202 pounds and he would cart it um, to tent meetings as well. The activities at the farms, the Terry homes were always havens for many ministers. Long before Clint married in 1851, he and his father hired halls in Agawam, Ellington, West Stafford, and other towns group met in New Haven, Derby, Waterbury, Winstead, Southwick Pond, Skidico, and elsewhere. While Clint and his family lived on their farm in Windsor Locks, a large tent was pitched in the yard, and Reverend Joseph Turner preached his gospel and philosophy every evening and some Sundays for some time. Joseph Turner, Reverend Joseph Turner, went on to be quite a famous minister. Other Adventist tent meetings. From the beginnings at Wilbraham, there followed the rental and purchase of the meeting ground at Springfield. Of note are some of the names and those in attendance Still active at this gathering in 1868 was none other than Joshua V. Himes. He was the publicist for William Miller. These folks were listed on a photo of the Springfield National Advent Camp Meeting in 1868. Prior to, Windsor Locks had Dr. Joseph Turner and wife, um, the brothers Fenn, E.B. Potter, Will Judd, uh, no initial Morse, and Dr. Waterbury. <coughs> there was a split, and the union went to Wolfsboro. And in 1864, brother Deodate Palmer and Clint Terry's father Solomon hired a grove in Enfield on the bank of the Connecticut River near the Warehouse Point Railroad Station, and many who believed in the 1867 time attended. And quite a list, led by none other than Dr. Charles Parker, well known here. And it goes on. Uh, in Wilbraham, George Storrs was there. We mentioned George Storrs back in talking about the revival meetings. 
and so on. And again, hard copy of this will become available also. Here's one. The 1873 Terry's Island attendees. After Clint moved to the island, there were many meetings that were held there. The following spoke with reporter Joseph Becker of Frank Leslie's Illustrated Weekly on 11-5-1873. We're here because today for this. Celebration of the 150th anniversary of that gathering. Um, and again, the program is going to be held in Suffield and Enfield as well as they are the bordering towns of the island and a uh, great amount of history there. Those will be done in November. And we would love to have a tent meeting. We're going to kick that around here. And also Suffield has expressed interest in hosting it as they have a couple of acres at their museum on which it could be placed, gather up a few of the ministers of the area and have them give a bit of history of their um, operations. So, these names, Elsie Thorne, William N. Pyle, ex-Chancellor Halstead, who I believe probably was associated with Wilbraham Academy, S.W. Bishop, George W. Brown, Reverend Brown out of New Jersey, Another one quite noted. Charles C. Barker, Fred Miller, Eliezer Storrs, probably uh, a descendant or relative of um, George Storrs. George Storrs held the title to the island for a short time before Clint. Mrs. C. C. Barker, Mrs. Dr. Barker, Mr. and Mrs. Emery W. Smith, Mrs. Malvina Nevers, and small children, Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson. Um, during that time period, there were uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson listed in Hazardville section of Enfield. Maybe the same, there are all kinds of loose ends to change. Camp Bethel. Happy 140th. Mm -hmm. 145. 145? Yeah, I told you I forgot the paper with the numbers all written on it. Yeah. I knew it was close, though. <laughs> the first charter was done in Wilbraham, and then it got approved later on and that was 160 years ago for the original charter. Then charter came here, was approved, and the first meeting of Camp Bethel was held in 1887. So you see the two plaques out here or over there, somewhere on the way in. <laughs> I know they're there. And of course, the certificate of uh, being a national historic site. And a depiction, this is on the wall down in the history room also, um, of the, the tent. This is before all of the uh, cottages replaced the tents. A little bit about the island geography.
That's what it looks like from the air. The two small islands are those in the fog in the opening picture. And here is the island. We'll have something that will be clearer than that. It's now called King's Island on maps and such. The kings were from Suffield and uh, operated a ferry north of the island. Uh, as in Enfield, if you were to throw a stone back in the old days, you'd hit a peas. The same thing in Suffield. If you threw a stone, you'd hit a king. Uh, they were quite prevalent and were part owners and at one point there's like 16 owners and they have it all divvied up uh, in later times, mainly for a logging interest. 1879, um, the Army Corps of Engineers surveyed the river from Hartford to Holyoke in an attempt to improve navigation. A number of dams were proposed a number of times at the island um, with a new lock entering the canal uh, that existed there on the Suffield side for improved navigation, but it's bedrock. Nothing has changed. They redid the survey in 1898. I have both of them, hard copy, original hard copies of both of them. Nothing changes. You get south of the island, down through Windsor Locks, little bit of change, it's all hard packed gravel, so that doesn't change much. And north for time, up into Hadley, it's just more shale bedrock. If anything, it might have worn down by an eighth of an inch. Whoops, we can't ignore this. Right here is shown the barn and the house as little rectangles. And over across the way is another little rectangle that at one time Terry tried to grow some tobacco and it was a disaster. The weather just didn't permit it. I don't think God liked the idea of smoking <laughs> stuff. Anyway, a rough shed was built on that side to house uh, whatever there was of it. Now Terry vacated. It, it, he removed to Springfield about 1893 and folks named Blodgett came on and operated the farm for at least a couple of years. The youngster, he turned 18 while he was on the island. In 1893, he started a diary. Some local folks of the Methodist Church taught him how to read and write. And he started a diary, and you can see the improvement as it went along into 1894, it's, I analyzed the whole thing, and there's such detail in about everything they grew, what they hunted, what they fished, what they ate, trapped, on and on and on, which was a diary picture of what the Terrys did. Terry also had a sawmill out there. And another thing I have is not the actual cumbersome pieces of the sawmill, which are three gear parts, um, but a diagram to figure out how many RPM the horse going around in one minute would make for RPMs to the pulley. Six RPMs is not enough to saw lumber you need about 40, which is usually driven by a water wheel. However, you have pulley and another 
pulley, take off pulley, and it increases the revolution. So he successfully sawed lumber into boards and studs and things. Um, but the interesting part is um, a fellow who goes kayaking out there almost daily in the good weather, uh, our good friend, and uh, he's mainly Indian, I'm part Indian, we have another Mohawk Indian friend. Uh, Mark sends me a text with a picture and says, you know what this is? There's another part of the base gear that he found last year, I guess. So now there are two parts of it. But again, they're hefty to cart around. In the book, there's an ad for um, that particular kind of sawmill, an advertisement. Um, the picture is what the thing would have looked like. Boundary disputes between East and West. Hatoll Bridge was being built north of the island and the two towns were fighting over who's going to get the revenue. So instead of, <laughs> instead of um, the line running down the center of the island, it turned out with the Next analysis, in 1898, the final view of the court, um, the line is to the east of the house and barn, down the embankment, about 50 feet uh, horizontally and probably 100 feet this way. The island uh, caps out at 113 feet max elevation right near the house and barns. So there's one of the five monuments that they put onto the island to set the boundary. There's the judgment. Pynchon Island, well, John Pynchon got a couple of sailors to set the uh, boundary between Massachusetts and Windsor Locks. Um, somewhere with a compass and something or other, a telescope, I guess, they made that uh, survey all the way across Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut and Rhode Island also. They started making their mistakes as far back as Rhode Island, and they ended up about 10 miles downstream from where the border is now. So the island is in Connecticut now, but was in Massachusetts back in the day, and granted to John Pynchon for his work in establishing that boundary, such as it was. So it was called Pynchon Island for quite a while in 1681. So hence the boundary dispute. Bill would remember this. <laughs> this is the remnants of the Barn Foundation, sadly. Frost wedging keeps caving in the stone foundation. Um, It's just sad that, you know, some crew doesn't go and put the foundations back into better shape. The one that is in good shape is the one that was the ice house. Um, and it took up a space of about four pews. And uh, it's still there. There's also the cistern uh, in which they kept the water. The main feature of the barn was that's where uh, meetings were held for uh, the period awaiting the end.
there and there are the gears from the uh, sawmill. Uh, back in 1957, a fellow named Frank Taylor, who passed a month or so ago, uh, was a writer for the local press. And uh, in, I guess, 1960, he published that. Um, There's the photo he took back in the 60s. There's the foundation. And there is a whole gear and more of the um, other cast iron gears. Right here is a plow share. And State Senator Cornelius O'Neill grew up near the island and scoffed the handle to the plow back in the 50s or so and has it at his house. So we're going to hook up and see if the plowshare I have fits. <laughs> we'll get this history all together. Then you have to put an addition on because my library, the little room in the back, that's like the size of my library with all this research stuff you could have. Yeah. Ah, just some odds and ends. Like a walk in the park in early spring, the rare, but common on the island, pink lady slipper. Also on the shale cliffs on the west side, it gets full of columbine. Columbine grows right out of the cracks between the rocks, red columbine. And I have seen in my days the rare but rare yellow lady slipper. Not many. And maybe, just maybe, you might get the feeling you're being watched if you visit the island. Deer, occasional bear, uh, usually at this time of year, there's like 12 to 18 inches of water between the canal and the island, and you can walk across the slippery shale carefully to get there. End of days? Mm -hmm. Didn't happen. Charles Hayes Russell, again, um, was involved in the watchtower. Um, they claimed that the end would occur in 1873, based on their belief of 6,000 years since creation. Uh, in, a, in 1940, three or four, they modified that as uh, an error due to uh, things in the King James Bible. And on it goes. Many predictions to this day. Pred uh, harbingers of ill times, uh, the horse influenza in the fall of 1872, which by spring had spread nationwide, crippling transportation and impacting commerce. Stock market crash on Friday, September 19th, 1873, followed by a recession. Describes the great episodic where they had the flu and the horses would cough, they were weak. Um, the only cure for which was rest, and horses weren't able to get much in the way of rest. Usual prophecy of John of Patmos, the book of Revelation speaks of many visions and the visuals attendant, like the familiar four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
conquest, war, famine, and death, white, red, black, and pale. Uh, there wasn't any war at the time, but it's always imminent. Um, rarely there's no conflict beyond a period of 20 years. And that panic of 1870 through three uh, carried on, undoing a lot of the work uh, that was done in the Industrial Revolution to expand the economy. Newspaper articles of things that went on. The local band. I believe I have a paper copy of this with me. That chart has a number of dates on it and they relate to various predictions coming out eventually at 1873. And that was in the ledger from the store that the Terry's had in Warehouse Point. Joan Gorgas and myself worked months in exploring where the Terry ledgers, photo albums, and such could be placed with a guarantee that they would be archived and kept. And it, it worked out um, in Springfield. There's the quadrangle with a number of museums and a new museum across the street from the quadrangle, uh, the Wood Museum. And they have a fireproof archive and we received a promise of perpetuity for storing all the Terry materials there. So that's where the stuff's safely kept and available for research. And that's where that journal is. The local band associated with Life and Advent Union. History's come to show many philosophies pretending the end of the world predictions and the end still elusive, the best Predictions made with even the best of modern methodology fall short of their mark. As the Millerites pass somewhat into obscurity, the majority becoming Seventh-day Adventists, a small scattered remnant, the Timists became much more calculating in their pursuit of the date of the Second Advent. Joshua Himes. He met Miller in 1839 in Exeter, New Hampshire, invited Miller to speak at Chardon Street Chapel in Boston. 1840, he published and edited the first Millerite newspaper, The Sign of the Times in Boston. He also published the first Millerite prophetic chart. In 1842, he started a second newspaper, The Midnight Cry in New York. And brought great attention to Miller's work. Miller was a Baptist minister. He had a farm just out of uh, Vermont. Route 4 crosses out of Vermont into New York and the farm is over there and operates as a museum also. I went there to do some research. And a worthwhile stop. The Millerite chart of 1843. I have a black and white copy of that. It's the Thayer lithograph of the first Millerite in 1843 prophetic chart designed by Charles Fitch and Apollos Hale, published by Himes. The interesting thing about Apollos Himes is he hooked up with none other than Dr. Joe from the tent meetings in Windsor Locks. Mm -hmm. 
So Terry traveled in a very noted wide circle of important folks. Some other editions of the charts of prophecy at various times uh, and in the history room there are more. But one in particular we'll talk about. And some accounts. The newspaper account in Frank Leslie's newspaper. Um, again, the sketch artist wrote the article. Uh, according to the firm belief of the religious denomination known as Second Adventist, the end of the world should have happened on last Wednesday, November 5th. Uh, and so on, and talks about the folks who were there, which helps to make the list. The artist was Joseph Becker, and he was noted for his work uh, of the laying of the transatlantic cable and some works during the Civil War. There are his sketches. One of the... Hello? Gee, and you're a new battery. Anyway, upper left uh, tent, the barn also. Uh, upper right, a fellow towing a boat along the canal on their way up to Terry's ferry that he operated between the island and mainland at a crossing area uh, that was owned by Deodate Palmer and went into uh, being owned by uh, Palmer's children. And that's uh, one of them um, conducted the deed work for uh, transfer of that bit of land near the canal for the landing zone. A long time waiting, uh, various activities. The big one is here in the barn number of people gathered listening to a lecture by not sure who, but this right here and this smaller one over here and something else going on up here. Yeah, let's take a closer look at that one. Hmm. There we have the three charts. This one I have not looked at hard enough to track down. This one, however, says Javit, Ham, and Shem. And see these two capital letters, a big S and a big E, and the rest of what's on it. Remember that. This is just another account of what went on on the island. Uh, an aside. Adventists stayed on the island beyond the end of November for at least another month, figuring something went wrong in the calculation. Local legend said they stayed until they had eaten all of Quint's 200 turkeys. I also have a copy of his letter to the editor of the Springfield Republican refuting that uh, legend. He said, no, they didn't. <laughs> but that, that story still pervades and 
I just jump on people. Okay, now the other shoe drops. Uh, conversation with David, uh, Dwayne Crabtree, up at the now university, Brookshire Christian University. Uh, Dwayne is the college curator and librarian. I met him here a few years back when he spoke. Uh, we've been in contact since. Turns out that that chart from the barn was found eventually, restored, framed, and now hangs in the history room. So you can see the real deal. The artist, it's signed A. H. Cleves. Um, apparently he was an engineer. He was also uh, a minister who went through Wilbraham Academy. And he did a book around 1900, a collection of hints and helps for machinists, metal workers, model makers, watch and tool makers, jewelers, draftsmen, etc. On one of the antique book dealers on eBay once upon a time, I saw a notation which was exciting that the book contained about 125 religious sketches and drawings. Apparently it was some other volume because this doesn't. I have one of these and it does not contain any of those drawings. But somewhere out there, there's another thing to search for. There we go. The Japhet, Shem, and Ham names. Noah's sons. And ta-da. There's the chart. And this, of course, made from a couple of photographs to eliminate as much reflection as possible. Right when you walk in the door, there it is. So you want to do that. And there it is. Of course, this is uh, from two spliced together photographs by none other than my graphic art son again. <laughs> Then, something about the Terries beyond 1873, July 1, 1885, and the island meeting still continue. A basket meeting for the 4th of July. And we hope to see a goodly number at this meeting, as in all probability this will be the only meeting this year which, in which the study of prophecy will be a specialty. House and barn room, also if notified in time, will have tent room for any that wish it. The station is at Windsor Locks. From there you get off the train, walk up the canal bank to the island ferry. And that appeared in 1885. Terry's removed to Springfield. We're still in search of Terry's 1864-65-ish diary. Edith Ball mentions that diary, but nobody knows where it is.
Flint kept uh, a journal, and in it he discusses all his daily events, uh, how he was feeling medically, this, that, and the other. And the journal runs from May of 1902 to June of 1905, and sadly, Clint passed in um, December of 1905. But many similarities between George Blodgett's diary and Clint's journal. Then there were these guys. Yeah, that'd be me on the left, Joan in the center, David and Dory to the right. And again, they're in the history of Romar charts, the big one. <laughs> I have a whole chapter on humor related to the end of the world. <laughs> I just had to throw that in. And here's a disclaimer, one of two. The author takes no responsibility for any detriment to the reader's sanity that might ensue should one undertake to attempt using the date data contained herein to try to make another prediction of the date of the end. The end. <laughs> and this disclaimer, anything that falls into copyright falls into copyright and good luck with that because section 107 of the copyright law says go ahead and use it as long as not for profit for educational purposes. Yeah. <laughs> I've been told there would be questions. Do I recall correctly that one of the Terry's was instrumental in the founding of the Hartford Electric Light Company, Northeast Utilities? Terry Steam Turbine Terry was from the Windsor area and they had a dam over there. Yep. Uh, Hartford Steam Boiler Insurance evolved out of it. I don't know the answer. I've not researched that in what has been added to this by a relative in Rhode Island, I believe, uh, who Joan was in contact with all the time. Right in the introduction of it, there is a genealogy, and I'd have to look to see if somewhere in there are the name appeared. So here's an associated question. Um, Eversource, the... Um, Can everybody hear it? The successor to Northeast Utilities owns that island now. Um, and there was always proposals they to do. dams. And, so did the Terry's sell that to the precursors of Eversource, or were there owners in between? Yes. Um, there were owners in between. He sold it to somebody named Douglas, who was in the lumber business from once a lot. Um, that went off quickly to another lumbering interest out of Suffield. At one time, um, Horton of Horton Chuck Company in Windsor Locks was involved along about 1927. There was a major flood, and from that evolved uh, flood control dam proposals. And Horton ended up getting involved in getting the island purchased. Eventually, in 1960, Northern Connecticut Electric Light 
predecessor of Eversource and others. Um, they were based in Windsor Locks, and they bought the island complete. There were other owners scattered along the way uh, after Terry. Um, Terry didn't own the whole island. He owned probably two-thirds of it. Uh, we have maps of ownership uh, divisions and things. Just too much to try to do at one sitting. Um, so it came into the hands of Northeast Utilities and eventually Eversource. And it is technically a division of Eversource called Rocky River Realty. It's associated with the Atomic River. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> I've been there, done that too. Yep, absolutely. Uh huh. You're well read. <laughs> and yeah, uh, the Housatonic River—that's uh, another whole story. Um, and I do a program called, pardon me, but it's called "Damn That Dam." And uh, it's the history of the rivers here, there, and along through the Connecticut Valley, some, a number of them. Eventually, 1955 happens, major flood. Abe Ribicoff had poo-pooed the idea of building those dams in 1952, saying the money would be better spent on the military. So he wasn't everybody's friend. 55, he was embarrassed because his governor hey, has this nice big flood. And finally, something was done about flood control dams. And with all this rain, we have uh, survived without huge amount of flooding. I mean, the media blows it out of proportion generally. Uh, yes, farmland, low-lying land called intervales get flooded first. But it wasn't running down the streets of Hartford and as it was in 1936 and 38. I grew up living on the river, um, on River Road in Windsor Locks. We had a boat livery and rented up to 24 boats at one time for shad fishermen in the spring, so. Uh, what did I say yesterday when I went to get the car in the rain? Slightly damp is better than soaking wet. <laughs> yes. So everyone can hear. Well, Steve asked about Helco. The growth of the company, oh, well, let me start here. The growth of the company was rapid and increased customer usage demanded a new means of producing power. Edward Clinton Terry, grandson of Eli Terry, founded the Farmington River Power Company in 1890 to supply Helco electricity. Thank you. Yeah, Eli, Eli Terry was another guy who ended up in Terryville. Yeah. And, you know, he had his own fame to that, and I wasn't... But so he wasn't part of these Adventists? That no, he, well, he was from South Windsor to begin with. And uh, there's more. It wasn't a different Terry. It was the same Terry family. Yeah, you, you go back, 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 back to Dorchester, and uh, Samuel Terry came out of there and into Springfield, and so it splits, and he had two wives, and that's why you have Perlin's family, and you have Clint's family. Oh. Others? Here, I got one. Oh, okay. It? It? Over here. Great grand, we're all great grand. 
about is Lydia Isidore Hamdui, daughter of Diana Palmer, whom you mentioned. And Lydia kept a diary. She was born in 1850. She kept a diary from 1865 till she died in 1938. She was an owner of a cottage here, the cottage that my sister Dory owns. Okay. And in her diary, she mentioned Frank Leslie's article. Mm -hmm. and the sketches, and said that her father, Diane and Ed, who would be her brother-in-law, Edward Smith, were in the sketches. And oh. I could never find a, the sketches, so I'm very interested in those pictures. Were those all of the sketches that were in that article? Yes. So I don't know if... And um, either, either I'd like to had that. Um, you want to... I'll, I'll, Give me a second. Well, just give me a second. I'll run out to the car and I'll get. I believe I have the page. I think we're going to have to go down there. The, the choir is going to rehearse. Okay. The choir is going to be rehearsing in five minutes. Not here, though. No, not in here. We're rehearsing up in Fairview. Okay. Okay. You're all right then? Yeah. Okay. Let me go grab it. I think I have it. Otherwise, it's in the history room also. Picture of the insect tracks, and I'll leave that up over yonder here. Oops, this is the Joshua Harnes chart. Chart that's in the history room and the cover of the book. The island picture. And sadly, I don't have Leslie's newspaper. I thought I did. Leslie's newspaper thing. Um, you have one in the history room. Uh, because I bought the whole newspaper and I bought just the page. And the page comes and says, see the article on page such and such. When I bought the individual thing. Mm 